A little while ago, Time magazine put out an article uh, entitled, Why the COVID-19 Pandemic Has Caused a Widespread Existential Crisis. And one of the main paragraphs in that article from Time is the one that's on the screen here, which says, it will take years for researchers to fully understand the effect coronavirus has had on people. Right now, the dominant trend seems to be change itself. The COVID-19 pandemic appears to have spurred a collective reckoning with our values, lifestyles and goals, an existential crisis of sort. Even though that was written in December 2020, I, th I think it's still relevant now. Whether it's the extra time that we've been given because we've been locked down, or the disruption to the status quo, or whether it's just this time of uncertainty and challenge that has made us reflect on what is most important. And it seems that many people are re-evaluating our work, our lives, our commitments, our values at the moment. Back in June here at the church, we did a series looking at a 24-hour period in the life of Jesus. And part of that series, we touched upon, um, yeah, just reflecting about our work and family and life balance. And I got a, a, some feedback from that series of people saying, that was really relevant because we are evaluating that at the moment, trying to work out, is there a better way to balance our life? It just seems to be that this COVID experience has been making us more think about our lives and, and where we're investing um, our time and our energy and our focus. But this article that from Time, you can look it up and read it if you want, um, actually goes a step further than that. It's not just rebalancing our lives that time suggests that we're doing, but for some people it's their foundational values and key life goals have been shaken by this experience. One part of the article um, has, yeah, was exploring some evidence that, that shows that during um, COVID there has been more breakup and divorces as well as more engagements and cohabitations than normal. It's almost like people are going, in this time, I'm re-evaluating my significant life relationships and what I want out of them. Lockdown has given people the mental and physical space to really get in and, and ponder every facet of life. And for some people, nothing has been overlooked. And I guess... This new sermon series that we're going to do for, for three weeks with a break in the middle for Thanksgiving Sunday, it stems from this thinking. But this existential crisis is not going to be the focus of the series. Uh, we sort of did that in the 24 series. Rather, I'm going to be pondering some people in the Bible, some Bible characters who went through similar experiences, not COVID, but these experiences where they were you know, either forced or just brought to a point where they were considering life or re-evaluating their values or what was important to them. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at a single phrase um, that, as I said before, is only found about a dozen times in the Bible, but it is actually only um, used five times in this context. The one thing, the one thing. And so the five times it is used is when uh, people consider the one thing you lack, the one thing is needed, the one thing I know, the one thing I do, and the one thing I ask or slash the one thing I seek. It's only used five times in this context of re-evaluating things and, and trying to decide what is most important. So whether we look at David or Martha or Paul or the rich young ruler, they're, they're all brought to this point of reflecting about what's most important in life and to work out in the midst of the many, many, many things that they were trying to consider, what was the one thing? What was the one thing? See, that's the point. We live in a society that we are saturated, absolutely saturated with choice. 
with opinions, with everything being at our fingertips, the immediacy of everything. There are just so, so many things that we have access to. And yet in these five Bible verses that we're going to consider, we're confronted, well, what's the one thing? What's the one thing? So you ready to jump into this? Today's reading is from Psalm 27, uh, all of Psalm 27. And if you uh, have it in front of you, whether you can grab a Bible and actually put it in front of you, I'm going to be referring to different parts of it, or you might want to pull it up on your phone if you're not using your phone to watch this service on. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to put it on the screen anyway. So from Psalm 27, if you look at the title of Psalm 27, it actually tells us that this psalm was written by David, uh, which is not that unusual because David wrote about half the psalms. But David himself is a unique biblical character. He's an absolute hero of the Old Testament. He's the slayer of Goliath. He's the one of the great kings of Israel. He's the one who brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And yet at the same time, he was this flawed biblical character as well. He was not a great husband or father. Um, There was times where he was manipulative, where he struggled with lust and pride and greed. And ultimately, um, he was also a, a murderer and a deceiver. And yet within this complexity, David had a deep faith in God. One of the things that I... Not only can relate to a little bit, but deeply admire in David is his ability that when he mucks things up with God, he's straight back to God, confessing his sins and receiving forgiveness. For David, there was no hesitation. There's no wallowing in guilt. David knew how to return home to God and to the grace and mercy that God receive, uh, that God can give. So as I said, David is this complex character. But let's focus in on Psalm 27, this psalm that David wrote. The psalm has two distinct sections in it, and if you've got it open in front of you, you can see where this tone changes as we read through Psalm 27. Verses 1 to 6, David declares the power and the confident hope that God will bring rescue and protection from all enemies. Highlighted in verse 1 and 2, where he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? But if you read through it, you'll notice that when we hit verse 7, the tone changes. There's a distinct change in, in the way that David is speaking. After declaring the certainty of God's power and protection, David then changes to praying for rescue and deliverance and almost pleading to God not to forget him, not to turn away. As one commentator says, you know, this is quite a human response. It's very normal. It's almost like we can say David knows that he can trust God. But that knowledge doesn't make him immune to the fear that he is feeling. And so he's trying to hold these two together. He knows his enemies are closing in, and yet he wants to declare God's protection, but still pray that God might help. The important thing here is that rather than panicking or despairing, David does remember that God can that God can be trusted, that God is good. And even if it means, as he says in the last part of the, the psalm, that he might have to wait for it, he's going to trust that this protection, that this help is there. The other interesting part about Psalm 27 is that we're not quite exactly sure when it was written. A lot of the times with David, he's writing a psalm in response to some of the things that he's currently experiencing in his life. And there is no indication anywhere that Psalm 27 was written to a particular event. Although some commentators have guesses. They like to guess 
that what he might be referring to. And the two, uh, two of the guesses that I was reading about yesterday were, uh, the first one was in response to the events of Psalm uh, uh, 1 Samuel 21 and 22, chapters 21 and 22. In, in those two chapters, um, it's a part of the story where uh, David has been anointed king, but he's not yet king. And the current king, King Saul, is running around trying to kill David because um, A, he's jealous, but B, he also doesn't want to lose his kingship to David. And as part of this story in these two particular chapters, David makes some decisions in his running away from Saul. And not that these decisions were necessarily led directly to it, but indirectly David's decisions um, led to people getting hurt, particularly the priests of Nob who were killed by Saul because they helped out David. The other guess that this psalm um, may have been written about or written in response to is the events of 2 Samuel chapter 6. And in this story, uh, David is now king. And uh, if you know what happened uh, many years before, before David was king, uh, in a battle uh, which Israelites were losing, they decided if they took the Ark of the Covenant uh, into the front line in this battle against the Philistines, that that would give them the extra edge to beat the Philistines. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way. The Philistines uh, beat them and took the Ark, <laughs> which devastated the Israelites uh, because they lost their most prized um, you know, item, in, in religious item. And then many years later, uh, in, as it goes through, the, the Philistines actually give it back. Um, but it, it doesn't come back to Jerusalem for a long time. And David decides he needs to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And so he goes and he picks it up and they put it on a, on a cart. And as the cart is going along, it wobbles and Uzzah reaches out, tries to steady the Ark of the Covenant, uh, touches it and dies. And um, David is angry with God for killing Uzzah and is scared of God because <laughs> Uzzah died. And in the end, he just basically takes his bat and ball and leaves the Ark of the Covenant at Odom Eden and goes home, just gives up and goes home. In, as I said, we don't really know if Psalm 27 is written in relation to either of these stories, but let's just run with that for the moment. Because in both of these stories, in both of these stories, David is double guessing himself and his decisions. In both of these stories, the enemies are closing in, whether it's the literal enemy of King Saul trying to kill him, or in 2 Samuel chapter 6, there was a lot of people being very critical of David and what he was trying to do. So he's, he's being you know, double-guessing his decisions. He um, is angry that people have got hurt by his decisions. And, and he's frustrated and blaming himself. And he's asking deep questions about his leadership and about himself, his, his own self. So what was his response to all of this? If all the things that David is trying to work through, what is the one thing that he decides he needs to focus on the most at this point we get back to the main part of the psalm where he says the one thing I ask of the Lord this only do I seek to be to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple do you find that interesting in his doubt anger fear confusion everything that's going on in David's life, the one thing he seeks, the one thing he asks from God is to be in God's presence. I want to ask the question, why? If you're angry and scared and you've got enemies closing in and you've got, you know, it's doubting yourself, why seek God's presence? Well, I think... Verse 5, the next verse in Psalm 27 gives us part of the answer where he says, For the day of trouble, God will keep me safe in his dwelling. God will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. 
If you remember back to the Job series that we did when we were reflecting on um, yeah, the Old Testament book of Job, uh, I made a, made a point that in difficult times we, we have a choice. We can be angry with God, we can be frustrated with God, we can push God away. Or we could lean into God during difficult times and be embraced by God's love and presence. Both, both options comes with complexities. But David says the one thing he seeks is to lean into God, to be in God's presence. I actually think that the word that David uses in his psalm, seek, is is intentional and significant. He says, the one thing I seek, the one thing I seek. So I mentioned earlier, David seems to have a good understanding of the nature of God. And David knew that God's love and mercy and grace, whilst that was available to all people, he sort of seemed to know that God has a slight bias towards a seeking heart. And we see this throughout the entire Bible, this, this God responding to the seeking heart. For example, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God says, If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. Or Jeremiah 29, 13, when God is saying through Jeremiah, You will seek me and you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart. Or even Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount affirmed this as well when he said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone, Jesus goes on and says, For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks the door will be opened. So I said, David seemed to understand that God does indeed have a bias towards a seeking heart. And so in times of trouble, David says, there's just one thing that I seek, to be in the presence of God, to be close to God. That's what I need the most at the moment. If we just keep going with this word seek for the moment, both the Old and New Testament seem to affirm that this idea of seeking is setting the mind and the heart of something. It's the focus of our thinking, of our desires in a particular direction. It's the setting of the mind and the heart that, in a sense, is opposite to... I saw this in an article I was reading, mental or spiritual coasting. I thought that was a really interesting phrase, especially at the time. There's been times during this lockdown that I feel like I've been mentally coasting or even spiritually coasting. And this article is saying that seeking is the opposite of that, of the coasting idea. It's making the conscious decision to fix our attention and our affection on something. said at the beginning that, you know, COVID is stirring within a bunch of people, this idea of re-evaluating where our focus is. This time of crisis has made some people ponder the question, Where are we placing our attention or our affection? Of all the things that we can respond with, of all the ideas that we can explore when we're trying to wrestle with these questions, is this idea of the one thing relevant to us? Is it helpful to think about, well, what's the one most important thing that I should be placing my affection and my attention on? Are these words of David that we've been keep coming back to, are they relevant to us in the situation that we find ourselves in? One thing I ask from the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek God in God's temple. For me, the challenge of this reading actually is what does this mean for me? And maybe this is a challenge for all of us that can be reflected in two other Bible verses. 1 Chronicles twenty two nineteen that says, Devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord our God. 
Or maybe the words of Jesus from Matthew 6.33 when he said, seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things will sort themselves out. But seek first the kingdom of God. May God continue to speak to us, to guide us in these times. Amen.